They're everywhere. In all sizes, in all colors. On the sides of buildings, along railway tracks, and on the carriages of subway trains. Even in places which, in theory anyway, are inaccessible. Tags and graffiti have spread across the entire city. Some consider them an affront, others an artistic form of expression. But who are the taggers? By night, they climb over walls and infiltrate the heart of the underground transport system. Slowly but surely, they seem to be taking over the city. But the taggers themselves remain anonymous. The enigma of who they are is solved, partly at least, as several agreed to be filmed. A unique tribe, vandals to some, artists to other, urban guerrillas of a sort. Eric is 25, a student in audiovisual studies. He's been painting graffiti across Paris for the last five years. His self-confessed speciality, tag vandal, jargon for leaving his signature on walls and trains. He's agreed to introduce his gang, known as the VX. Five young men and one young girl, all aged between 25 and 30. Some are students. Others work. There's a messenger, a nurse, even a designer. In his backpack, Eric has spray paint and special marker pens with indelible ink. The night mission they are about to undertake is a risky one. Inside the metro, the Paris underground train system. We'll be down on the actual tracks near a station. And when the train pulls up to let people on and off, that's when we cross over the rails and tag the train in just the few seconds that it stopped. It's just for the fun of it, the challenge, the adrenaline rush. It's 10 o'clock in the evening at an underground station close to the Place de la Nation in the heart of Paris. The gang spreads out along the platform. Just between their feet, the live rail packs a 750 volt punch, easily enough to kill anyone that touches it. And at any time, a train could run them over. It's risky, but a final touch to blind the CCTV camera, and the gang is away. Isn't this vandalism? Yep. It's not the first time the gang has attacked an underground station. The penalty for this kind of continual defacing of public property is up to five years in prison and a fine of 75,000 euros, the equivalent of $100,000. But the VX gang is long gone. A few days later, Eric is in his small studio apartment in the suburbs of Paris. He keeps his face hidden. After five years of tag vandals, he knows the authorities are looking for him. In his room, some trophies from his more recent expeditions. Well, I stole this from the metro. Uh, it's one of their bits of uh, canvas. Uh, I sort of went crazy painting it. 
un petit délire artistique dessus. Mais ça appartient à la RATP. Mais ça appartient à la RATP. Mais ça appartient à la RATP. Oui, mais bon. Oui, mais bon. La RATP appartient aux graphistes. La RATP appartient aux graphistes. Voilà. C'est comme un album en fait. Like most graffiti artists, Eric keeps an album of souvenir snapshots that form a prized collection of all his exploits. Dozens of photos of tagged trains across France and also abroad in such places as London and Barcelona. Everywhere the same four letters, S-I-E-R, which spell out Sierre, his tag or alias in the graffiti world. This is a regional express which serves the Gare d'Austerlitz. But don't you feel bad about having damaged it? Well, it's not damaged, it's just colour. And it's ever so pretty when it pulls into the station. But the deed of which Sierre is most proud is not a train, but an airplane, and a special plane at that. Oh, one night with some friends, I had this sudden mad urge to, to leave graffiti on the Concorde. It was like, in, like a military zone, a sort of museum. It was a bit hard to get in, but once we made it, it was quite relaxed, actually. But why put graffiti on a plane? Well, it was the challenge and the pride afterwards to say we'd graffitied the Concorde, which doesn't fly anymore these days. So it all went well? <laughs> well, it ended with us hiding from the police and the military in the bushes for three hours. They chased us, but none of us were caught. But it was close. My family or my friends that aren't into graffiti don't understand why I take so many risks. But the point is not to get addicted. Because once you are, it's like drugs. Uh, there's no way out. Once a month, Eric heads out of town to participate in tag vandal excursions. This weekend, he's going to Grenoble. He gets his gear ready, including cans of spray paint stolen from DIY stores. But he prepares his own marker pens, making the ink as indelible as possible. I add pigments, uh, different colors. You sort of heat them up on the cooker to uh, burn off any, any water, and that makes the ink really indelible. Because we want our tags to, to last for as long as possible. Oops, I've spilt some. Sia's concoctions seem to work. So he sets off for a graffiti weekend in Grenoble in a good mood. When he arrives, there's a welcoming committee. Other taggers. Sia from Paris and Fame from Grenoble. First met three years ago and they now visit each other regularly. Yo, you okay? Ça va? Ça va? Okay. Salut. Okay. Bah, ce genre de weekend, on on this kind of weekend, all we do is graffiti, talk graffiti, graffiti eat graffiti, sleep graffiti. Uh, that's all we do. Like everywhere else, Grenoble has its share of graffiti. Last year, the bill for cleaning up graffiti in the town came to the equivalent of half a million dollars. <coughs> First stop is the home of one of the taggers. The gang gathers in the basement. Uh, this is where I keep my spray paints. How many have you got? Well, oh, there's about a hundred. Wow, that's a lot. All the kit, in fact, for the perfect tagger. A hundred cans of different colored paint. Pliers to cut through the security fences at the railway depot. And even carnival masks. Well, we wear the masks to, to hide our faces when we're painting. Uh, this, this one's mine. And finally, 
latex gloves. Why you wear gloves to stop leaving fingerprints on the spray cans. Uh, we even wipe the spray cans afterwards, so there's no need to worry about fingerprints. Is, isn't that a bit much? Well, it's better safe than sorry. Best to take all the necessary precautions ahead of time. Besides, it only takes three seconds and it's done. The next morning, and the team is ready for action. Their target is the railway depot. Prépare le crime. Yeah, we're getting ready for the crime. On a piece of paper, someone sketched out the graffiti they plan to create. With just one phrase, the world is ours. It's from the film Scarface, uh, a little Tony Montana with spray paint. I like the words, the world is ours. The hit is underway. The security fencing around the depot had been discreetly cut a few days beforehand. And it takes the taggers less than a minute to reach their objective. Before starting, though, one final precaution. It's not going to padlock the door uh, of the railway police here. That... All right, let's put the key in my pocket. Well, why do you do that? Well, just to buy us some time, just in case. Well, in case what? Well, so that if the police come by car, we'll have enough time. They'll open the gate with their keys, but we put our own lock now, so it'll slow them down. But uh, let's hope it doesn't come to that. The tagging can begin. They intend to cover an entire carriage. And for the first five minutes, all goes smoothly. Oh, there's some guys cleaning up over there. Come on, let's, uh, let's head out of here. No, it's okay, they're going. No, it's okay, they're just cleaners, it's all right. The taggers aren't sure. Sierra wants to make sure the way is clear. Oh, I just want to check. Uh, this wasn't meant to be the way it would work. Aren't you worrying a bit too much? Maybe, but better to be paranoid than being locked up. The danger seems to have passed, and the taggers resume their work. It takes 25 minutes to complete a fresco like this one. Uh, so, what's this feel like? Uh, there's nothing else like it. It's a, it's a unique feeling. It's like shooting up a really strong adrenaline rush. After this, I'm going home to have Sunday lunch with my parents. Uh, just as if nothing had happened. If they're caught, they'll be charged with damaging property and face the same stiff penalties of imprisonment and heavy fines. But why don't you just paint on the walls in the street? It's uh, surely it's much safer. No, I know, but it's uh, it's much prettier on a train. It'll travel around and people will see it. Lots of people. So it's cool. You know, I'm proud of it. I did it. I like it. Well, it's nice. The taggers know the train will be scrubbed clean in a matter of days. So to immortalize their deed, it's time for the traditional group photo. And just enough time to admire their handiwork before leaving. That evening in town, the gang relaxes at the end of the weekend. After the excitement, stress and rush of adrenaline, it's time to reflect. It's art, no matter what anyone says. People used to be sent to prison in the past for expressing their feelings or revolt through their art. Now, I'm not saying that my graffiti means I want a revolution, but it's, it's a way of getting a message across. 
Un jour dans ma vie, je suis étudiant. One day, I'm a student. The next, I'm working. I feel I'm being forced to do these things somehow. So through these sort of things, my art, uh, I interpret it like stealing from time to time, uh, a way of getting a little of my own back. Uh, that way, the system isn't totally screwing me over. That's my message. It's taking the risks, feeling like I'm not stuck in a rut, that I'm not losing my soul, having to make a living. It's a conscious decision to live my life my way, not to be entirely dependent on the system, not just to be a brick in the wall. Most tigers claim their driving force is art. Like the FD. Once a month, these young Parisians choose a metro station to break into. This one has been carefully selected. With its wide, open platform area, it's the perfect canvas for their art. I'd begin right at the start of the poster, if, if I were you. Well, it's good to do this properly so that uh, people can appreciate your work. No good just doing any old junk with crap letters. Uh, we discussed it a lot uh, beforehand. We plan it out. And uh, if there are things to change, we adapt and make the changes. Each tagger has a specific task. This is the main character in the fresco they are about to paint. Remarkably, they take their time and don't appear concerned. The fresco takes two hours to complete. The next morning, the commuters on Line 9 will see for themselves what the taggers have produced. The core of FD is three young Parisians. The youngest is a graphic artist in a marketing agency. The two others are law students. They are experienced graffitists. For more than a year now, they have decorated the Paris underground with their colorful artwork. Well, most people think that graffiti is uh, the taggers' form of destruction, of, of vandalism, that they just want to deface things. But our aim is to go where you're not allowed, so that we can paint our frescoes in these places or do something really different with colors or with the characters. And so people, whether they like it or not, are certainly going to notice it. That's, uh, that's not an issue. They'll be impressed, either for good or for bad. It's like when kids tell their mum, look, that's a funny looking person. It's certainly a step away from vandalism. And they're willing to go to any extent for their art to be seen. Denis, for example, uses the rooftops of Paris as his playing field. Just 19, he climbs apartment blocks with his bare hands, something known as elevation in the world of graffiti artists. He risks life and limb to leave the words, Socle, his trademark on the walls of the city. He chooses places where his alias will be most visible, and given their height and location, will take years before they are scrubbed clean. And there are others who push their luck still further. Lid and Bank choose the rush hour to run the gauntlet of the metro authorities and of oncoming trains, risking their lives by crossing the rails. approaches, they take cover as best as they can in the tunnel. It's a risky, sometimes deadly game. Et euh, voilà. 
I drew this one at home, you see. Opie and Deal are friends. The three most important things in Opie's life are his work, his girlfriend, and graffiti. He bought me spray cans because I wasn't able to go out. And for five euros, you get enough for two graffiti. At 21, OP is a seasoned campaigner with many expeditions to the underground system under his belt. His speciality, tagging metro carriages that have been parked overnight. You know, once, once you get going, once you start painting, you get, to, you get hot, uh, you start to sweat, and then you feel cold and, and you hear noises everywhere. It's, uh, it's just a matter of uh, overcoming your fear. These are the last pictures of Opie. Two months later, and in the same tunnel where he was interviewed, he touched the live rail while trying to pick up his camera. He was electrocuted. Deal was with him when it happened and did what he could to help. We carried him up through, through the gate and, and a friend went to get his car. And we took him to the uh, nearest hospital, the Tournon. Uh, it was close by, uh, about 15 or 20 minutes after we'd arrived. The nurse came and told us that he was dead, electrocuted. There was nothing that we could have done. Opie, whose real name was Francois, was just 21 when he died for his cause, or for his recklessness. All that's left are his signatures on the walls of Paris. On average, two taggers are killed in the tunnels of the Paris metro each year. A few months later, and deal is before the judges in a suburb of the French capital. As unbelievable as it may seem, he kept on tagging in the metro even after the death of his best friend. After the accident, he was caught red-handed several times and is being charged once again with damaging property. Deal receives a four-month suspended sentence, a 2,000 euro fine, and 180 hours of community service. What are you going to do now? You mean, will I continue with my graffiti? Yes, I will, but it might. Uh, but I might take it easy for uh, for a bit. Uh, the trouble is that in a in a week or two weeks, uh, I'll be taking it easy, and then you forget about the judge and the sentence, and I'll be off again. Maybe not, but hopefully I will be able to cool it down. But you're being threatened with prison if you do it again. Uh, you're, you're not going to stop? Well, yes, I said I would. Well, you said you might. No, I said I wanted to stop, but who knows? In six months' time, I might be at it again. Most lawsuits filed against the graffitists are from the railway authorities. Railway executives won't go into details, but it's a major topic in their company newsletters. Cleaning up after the taggers costs the railways an estimated $40 million. Early morning at the Gare du Nord station in Paris. These four men are police officers who make up a unique special force, the Anti-Tag Brigade. It was created in 2001 and is commanded by Captain Merle. They're on their way to arrest a suspect. That's a young guy, he's just 20 years old, uh, but he's been very active these past two years. His, uh, his alias or nickname is Sega. And we're going to look for him this morning. Uh, he lives quite near the Gare du Nord. What are his targets? Metro, Metro tunnels, trains, uh, carriages. Essentiellement. They arrest about a dozen suspects every month. No, here we are. Uh, just park over there. The tagger they are after is known as Sega. His name is all over the walls near his house. 
Il y en a un sur la gauche, là, sur la porte. Ici, là. And inside the building, and even in the lift, more evidence of Sega's work. Yeah, here's the signature. Here's his name, Sega. Sega FXP. FXP. Oh, it's the police. So open up, please. But the address turns out to be the home of the tagger's parents. Uh, no, he's not here. Uh, can we uh, come in, please, uh, to have a talk, uh, to explain things? Listen, we have a, an arrest warrant for him for defacing property. Oh, I've had enough of this. They're tagging again, isn't it? I don't know if you've seen, uh, but his signature is even in the lift. Yeah, it's everywhere. We're, we've been worried sick for a long time. We've had to bring him home from the police station twice already. It's unbelievable. I'm fed up of what he's doing to us. Look, it's six in the morning now, uh, and once I had to go and fetch him from the police station, the other side of town, at four. I've had it. Well, this should be the last time. The police spent an hour with the parents. They leave with a backpack covered in graffiti. Well, it shows we had the right suspect, anyway. The police finally get the tagger's correct address across town. Do you often have to trail taggers like this? Oh, the whole time. Uh, when we know uh, where they live. Open up, please, police. C'est la police. Bonjour. C'est la police. Why are you here? Well, why do you think? For defacing and damaging property, tags, you know. Over the past few months. Uh, we'll explain it to you later. It's 7.30, sir, and you're under arrest. Well, even if I've got classes, uh, you're under arrest and we've been round to your parents' place. And uh, we found this. So, let's go, young man. The police search the premises, and 30 minutes later, they appear to have found enough to incriminate their suspect. Sega is taken to the police station. Back in their offices at the Gare du Nord, the officers look through their hall. A lamp stolen from the metro, CDs and photographs of the tagger. But Captain Merle already had enough evidence, and the case is ready to go. Well, sometimes we don't even really need to search a suspect's home. It might help occasionally, uh, verify the identity behind the nickname, or to find some evidence, and to see what sort of place he, he lives in. Otherwise, most of the case files are already pretty complete, so the gift is already wrapped, even before we pick up the suspect. This thick file is what Captain Mel calls the gift wrapping. Inside, complaints by the railway authorities against Sega, photographic evidence of the tags, each filed by location and date, and the cost of cleaning up for each graffiti. Well, it's a typical example of the kind of things they do, both on the outside and the inside of the underground carriages. Vous 
How many garages do you think uh, Sega has personally painted? I have to say, dozens and dozens for sure, uh, that we can say. Uh, probably a lot more that have yet to be attributed to him. Sega's creations cost more than $12,000 to clean up. The evidence is provided by the railways, but it's up to the police to put the faces behind the aliases. Look at this train here, for example, uh, even if it's not the clearest photo. The usual sort of police work, phone tapping, informants and tracking suspects down on the internet. It's become a habit for some taggers to share their exploits on certain specialized internet sites. Uh, this is a video of two graffitists. Uh, it's been downloaded off the internet. Here they're, they're painting a false alias, and just below it, later, they put their real nickname. You can make out uh, Pepe, that's P, an E, another E, and Deal. And now they're making off because the railway police have shown up. According to the anti-tag unit, there are some 150 suspects in the greater Paris area who specifically target trains. The authorities believe they have a good indication of about 100 of them, and it's just a matter of tracking them down. Among the suspects is Guillaume, 23 years old, a student by day and known as Hermes by night. He's one of the most enigmatic of all graffiti artists. This evening, he's getting ready for one of his trademark commando missions. His secret weapon, a passkey. Here's the passkey to get into certain parts of the metro system. Not everyone has these, but copies are known to circulate. It gets us down into the stations. Hermes agrees to be filmed in action. It's half past one in the morning. The Paris Metro service has shut down for the night. Using his skeleton keys, Hermes has no problems getting inside. No one's about, and the game is afoot. Two or three nights a week, Hermes scours the metro tunnels, looking for hidden away places to leave his signature. In three years, he has left his mark in over 200 locations on the metro system. He's one of the rare taggers that has never been caught in the act. His target on this mission is a special underground train deep below the ground in the south of Paris. It's a bit like a military service, uh, you know, hiding yourself for 15 minutes, waiting for that right moment when no one's about uh, to remain unobserved, un undercover like the special forces. Uh, it's uh, just a game, really. An alarm goes off. Hermes switches off the lights and hides in the darkness. All right, hurry up. Unsure, he prefers to play it safe. Let's get as far away as possible. Yeah, it's what freaks you out, not knowing what these, what these noises are. Moments later, a metro carriage with workers pulls up at the station, blocking Hermes's escape route. There's no way to get past as the railway workers begin their shift, so Hermes simply changes direction. It's all in a night's work. He makes his way through a narrow passage. It's hard work, 
and dangerous, sliding through a casing close to the high-tension rail. Uh, it's quicker this way. He emerges in one of the service corridors of an underground station. At this time of the morning, the place is deserted. It's one of the staff officers of the Metro. It's a break room, a small power station which serves an entire branch of the Paris underground. In theory, it's strictly out of bounds to all but the system's engineers. There's not much in the way of security down here at night. Lots of taggers have uh, been through here before. Just out of curiosity, Hermes takes a peek behind the door. A short distance away, there's a ladder that leads down to the tracks. To get back on the right path, Hermes uses his secret weapon. It's a map of the entire underground system of Paris. There you are. I can use this now to see, to see exactly where I am. There, all right. there it is. That's where we are. The map shows all the service tunnels and conduits the general public know nothing about. It's a treasure trove for the graffiti artists. And incredibly, it's on sale for just $7 in certain shops. Hermes finally reaches his destination. There's a final check to make sure the way is clear. Okay, we'll try and make it through this way. The old carriages are just behind this gate. And it takes Hermes an hour to cut his way through the wire and the padlock. Hermes, you're breaking and entering. You better believe it. Mission accomplished, and he's inside. The tour can begin. A train from the 1920s, frozen in time, yet covered in decades' worth of graffiti. No one, it seems, has ever bothered to clean up the train's 12 carriages. Oh, you know, un unearthing a place like this. Uh, I came across it about uh, two years ago. Uh, it's like being an archaeologist, almost. But this is uh, its like a bonus, uh, discovering really old stuff and knowing you're the only person uh, who knows how to get down here. And who knows what's down here, too. Hermes leaves his mark for posterity. Soon it's time to leave. The first trains are already running and passengers are beginning to assemble on the platforms. Getting out is risky. He'll need to make his way to a station with trains passing in both directions. Uh, mind the live rail, though. Coming up from the tunnel, Hermes has almost certainly been spotted. He wastes no time as the security guards could arrive at any moment.
So what uh, what are you doing now? <laughs> well, we sort of just sort of winged it, really. Yeah, uh, just uh, was the only way I, uh, to come out quickly. On bouge quand même. Hein? Uh, we better split though. <laughs> quickly, Hermes puts away his camouflage kit, and once again becomes Guillaume the student. In just a few hours, he'll be back in the lecture halls. The Belleville market in the north of Paris. Taggers aren't fussy about what they'll target. In this case, it's nine trucks, much to the dismay of their owners. Does this graffiti upset you? Well, of course, it drives me nuts. It costs a lot to buy and operate a truck. So when you show up and you see your trucks like this, I really bust my balls. Do you know who does this? No, but if I ever catch them, they'll be sorry. Because look, it's covered from top to bottom. What would happen if you actually caught one? Well, better not. Better not ever let me catch them at it. I'll tear them apart. Hassan's truck has escaped being decorated. But in the market, it's just a matter of luck. Look, there's my truck. It's clean, see? Because every time it gets graffitied, I buy a special product and hire someone to clean it all off with it. That's uh, how it stays clean. But if you look over there, there are plenty of trucks that have been tagged. Uh, that's just wanton vandalism. The solution lies in stiff sentences. Make the culprits pay for the cost of cleaning up the truck again. And be severely punished, uh, as an example to the others. Underground trains and trucks have been a favorite target ever since graffiti took off in New York back in the 70s. It started as a protest movement. Youngsters from the ghettos trying to claim their identities by painting their names on the city's subway system. Yesterday's protests have become today's form of expression. Olivier Jacquet is a journalist who writes about urban art. Every day he sets off on his scooter to search for exceptional graffiti. His favorite hunting grounds, open urban spaces. Here's where there's the interesting stuff, in these sort of open areas like where we are. Uh, it's uh, run down, it's abandoned, and it's strewn with rubbish and stuff that's been just dumped, uh, it's wrecked. But there are wonderful graffiti, one, uh, one after the other. To this journalist, graffiti are a form of artistic expression that needs to be deciphered. There you are, uh, here's a tag. One bay. One bay. Là, visiblement, c'est le même Clearly, it's the same graffitist. His tag is uh, here, it appears in this graffiti, and you, and you can see it's the same. Uh, in his case, his pseudonym gives it away. This one might take a little longer to uh, identify it, but the two are connected. They're both part of the same work, really. You see, their tags are also in their art. A few years ago, Olivier set up a publishing house, which issues a monthly review, which exclusively features tags and graffiti. It's called Graffit. Inside, hundreds of photographs. He's been sued by French railway authorities for publishing pictures of a high-speed train entirely covered in graffiti. The railways accuse him of inciting vandalism. Uh, they accused us of justifying this kind of graffiti. But all we had were just a handful of pictures, among hundreds of others, that depicted the entire range of graffiti art. Trains are part of the graffiti world. And it's not for us to say we won't or can't show them. Censor them out, in other words. The legal proceedings dragged on for three years, but Olivier was finally acquitted and he was allowed to continue publishing. Nowadays, his graffiti magazine sells about 30,000 copies each month. 
In many ways, tags have today developed into a business with their own stores, some 100 in France alone. Finding them is easy enough. Just follow the graffiti. This shop is in the east of Paris and does a thriving business, especially on Saturdays. It's owned by graffitists and provides all the necessary materials. Markers in all shapes and sizes. Perfect to leave one's nickname across the city. And allegedly indelible inks. And the best-selling items are spray cans. At less than $4 each, it's a thriving trade. How many cans do you sell? Oh, easily 2,000, 2,500 a week, sometimes more, sometimes less. Uh, it depends on the time of the year as well. You know, if the weather's nice or if it's not nice, if it's a holiday period and so on. Which is about 10,000 cans a month and increasing rapidly. The mountains of Catalonia in eastern Spain about 100 kilometers from Barcelona. This is the first purpose-built graffiti spray paint factory. Baggy trousers and the casual look. Jordi Rubio is the owner of Montana Colors, which he founded more than a decade ago. His aim was to provide spray cans that don't leak. In a large variety of colors, and at a price that even the most modest budget can afford. And he succeeded. Today, the company employs 70 people, produces 35,000 cans a day, and has become the internationally recognized brand. This palette uh, is off to Athens, this one's off to Belgium, and that one to Britain, and this one Chicago. We send out the stock according to the different orders from our clients. Uh, but who's going to use these cans? Graffiti artists. Everything is for graffiti. Jordi clocks up sales of three million spray cans a year. He's become the number one provider for graffiti artists, something no one believed was possible when he first started out. I remember when I first began asking the banks for money to get the business started. None of them were ready to help. They thought I was mad, that it was crazy and that we were just anti-social vandals. Uh, but personally, anyway, I thought uh, graffiti were great and that the public appreciates it. Upstairs in his office, graffiti and posters set the tone. A bird covered in oil from a tanker spill and youngsters painting graffiti. The question is, who are the real vandals? Some accuse you of profiting on the back of vandalism. Well, our answer is always the same to that question. Uh, we just make a tool, like the person who makes knives, and who gets blamed when someone gets stabbed. A knife is a knife. How it's used is up to the user, not the maker. Today, even television has got in on the act. This is The Last Girls, a French cartoon which, among other subjects, portrays the life and times and the ups and downs of graffitists and taggers. With international sales to a dozen countries, the cartoon has proven successful. Not surprising if you realize the creative force behind it is made up of former taggers. They ravaged Paris back in the 1980s, calling themselves the PCP, which in French stood for the stupid little painters. More than 20 years later, they've developed a different art form. Commercial cartoons and storyboards, and have become writers and directors too. Despite their success, they still believe that graffiti culture belongs firmly in the streets. You paint the trains, the metro, because, well, it's something that moves around the most in an urban environment. It's the best way to get seen, a free publicity board that's constantly moving around town. 
It's something where you use what's already out there, advertising space, without needing permission and a bit of spray paint. I mean, every day on the street, on the metro, we're blasted by all sorts of stupid advertising. No one's uh, ever asked uh, your opinion, have they? You might not want to be subjected to uh, advertising in your face all day long, which wants you to buy this and buy that. Uh, they've got the right, apparently. Uh, well, at least we're not selling anything. Maybe that's why it's considered a nuisance, you see. So where, where's the problem? Personally, I don't mind it at all. After all, what is graffiti? Yeah, it's just colors on the wall. Know what I mean, even if it drives you mad. I mean, they're not muggers or drug dealers, just people who like to make something uh, differently and do it well. It's artistic. So yeah, okay, some people might hate it, but I couldn't care less because I'm com it's completely justifiable. It's just guys, painting. Tagging is all the rage. There's even a new computer game. In it, you play the role of Train, a graffiti artist who's wanted by the police. The aim is to paint your alias over as much of the town as possible. It's on sale just about everywhere, except Australia, where it's considered too subversive and been banned. We will be seen.